Halflings can be unusually lucky. In fact, I'm talking to Mike Merles about why halflings in the D&D multiverse live such a charmed existence. So halflings and gnomes are very different compared to elves and dwarves in that they aren't embroiled in the same level of, uh, of, of cosmic struggle that other folk are. Um, halflings are very interesting in that in the mythological record uh, of the history of the cosmos, there are some who believe that the, actually the, the halflings, whoever created them, it's not clear. Some, some folks say it is Yondala, but others say it, it was another god who disappeared. Maybe slain by groom, or went into hiding, who can say. But what we do know is that the halflings, they tend, because of this sort of cosmic luck they, they manifest, that luck seems to apply to their culture as a whole. That Yondala found them and saw them struggling to survive. They're physically weak, they're not skilled mages, but they are good at hiding. And that's something that a gift that she gave to them, along with their luck. That a halfling village, uh, tucked away in, in a, a fall, forgotten corner of the forest, when uh, the orc horde comes rampaging through, the orcs just happen to miss the trails that lead to that small village. That when the humans, the human kingdoms go to war, they, for, they just simply overlook the fact there's a halfling village in the area. No one thinks to go raid it or pillage it. Maybe the, the records of it are misplaced. Maybe the map, whoever, the cartographer, forgot to take note of it. Um, or put it on the wrong spot on the map. Uh, things like that. The halflings always seem to have bounces go their way. Now, it's not bulletproof. The halflings do have to endure some of the dangers of the world of D&D. But more often than not, it seems like when the halflings need a little bit of luck to keep them safe, they seem to get it. And this really contributes to this very almost idyllic existence they enjoy. This is they love their homes, they love simple creature comforts, because in many ways they haven't had to endure the same struggle that other folk have, have had to because they are so good at hiding. Whether they know it or not, they're good at finding those forgotten corners of the world and just living in quiet, peaceful, rustic existence. Farming, brewing, you know, each day just having its own s simple pleasures and simple challenges. But that does, is not the entire story of halflings, because we know there are halfling adventurers. And so in the halfling pantheon, their deities teach them through stories, rhymes, uh, jokes. The halfling deities prepare the halflings for the challenges they might face, but they do it in a way that is almost learning by accident. Uh, some halflings, when they reach, start to reach adulthood, they just get this kind of urge to travel. The halflings call it having fancy feet. That they just kind of want to see the world. What's beyond the fields? What's beyond our village? Most halflings don't feel that. They're happy to, pick, to take up a trade or start farming and, and continue on with their lives. But some halflings just get this urge to just go explore. Uh, their deity, Brenda Barris, maybe lures them away to a life of, let's, let's go see what's on the other side of the hills. And these adventurers, halflings who go out and almost invariably become adventurers, um, some, you know, might adventure for years, some just have a few adventures then to come back home. But they're the ones who see the world for what it is and start to understand what's happening and understand, oh, there are threats. We are lucky that we don't have to deal with these things. But just in case, these halfling adventurers who go and explore uh, and come back with stories, they carry on the sort of tradition of the gods. Uh, as an example, you might have, a, say, a halfling fighter, halfling who goes out in the world, becomes a fighter, and comes back with a horn of Valhalla. He might tell stories of his time fighting trolls and orcs, and the stories might be lighthearted and kind of funny, but they contain kernels of truth. So if a troll was to show up on the halfling's doorstep, they'd rem remember, oh, remember, uh, you know, remember our uncle's stories about the troll, the time he was cornered by the troll. Trolls don't like fire. So the halflings know to, to use fire against the invading troll. The, this halfling fighter who comes back may have had a horn of Valhalla, and he might hang it in the halfling tavern. And just tell them, hey, if anything ever really goes wrong, if we're ever in danger, just blow this horn. And the halflings have no idea the value of this thing. They just think it's an old curio, but they just know that when the goblin raiders show up, someone grabs the horn and gives it a blow, and then suddenly a horde of berserkers descends from Valhalla 
to, to crush the goblins. And the goblins have no idea what, you know, how, how this could have hit them. That that's a lot of what permeates halfling society is it's this idyllic thing, but halfling adventurers form this small cadre of very you know, elite, powerful individuals who not only go out and adventure, but they come back, they bring those stories and they share them. They share them in a way that doesn't frighten or alarm their neighbors, but it layers in the knowledge and lore they need just in case if anything happens. If, just in case if you see a dragon flying overhead, here's the arrow that you should shoot at. It's an arrow dragon slaying. The halflings don't know, but the halfling fighter comes home with just the right tools and just the right advice that if the halflings need to, they can keep themselves safe. And for that reason, the creatures who do decide to tussle, you know, to mess around with halflings, often find that while they seem like soft folk and physically small, they have a lot of surprises. They, have, they, they, they always seem to have the right tool at the right time, or, or that one old halfling who tends bard you know, turns out to be the 12th level fighter who's slain a blue dragon and has that warple uh, longsword tucked under the bar to pull out just in case you know, the orc raiders show up. So when the, the halfling's luck fails them, the legacy, the tales, the stories, the magical items gathered by the adventurers who go forth and come back, that then helps them get through those times when they have to rely upon themselves. They have to face a threat directly. But it's also why most folk, if they have a choice, why conquer a halfling village? It's just a small farm. There's no treasure there. They don't value gold and gems and powerful magic. Uh, there's, there's not much in it for the ambitious orc warlord. So maybe that, you know, the Horn of Valhalla and losing a few patrols is enough to convince him to leave them alone. Thank you, Mike Merles, for being on D&D Beyond and talking to us about the lore of halflings. I'm Todd Kenrick. Thank you for watching.